All right, folk, we're ready to make a start uh, for a meeting this morning. And can I apologise for the chair, Robin Schwann, who's unable to be with us today. He may be, may, he may be here later, we're not sure. <coughs> so uh, I'm filling in for him this morning. Uh, I'd remind members again of all electronic devices to be switched off. We're going to have a brief over, uh, or the overview for today. We we'll have an SR 2014-173, the industrial training levy construction industry order in Northern Ireland 2014. We have a briefing from the Vice Chancellor of Queen's University Belfast on his vision for the university. We have a briefing from the Department of Officials on the Employer Skills Survey, and we have a briefing from the Department of Officials on the review of uh, initial teacher education infrastructure. I have an apology from the Chair, Robin Schwann. Have we any other apologies? No other apologies? We move on to Chair's business. I want to advise members that submissions have been received from the South uh, Eastern Regional <coughs> College, the Northern Regional College, the College's NI, the Association for Real Change, Northern Ireland, and the new project to the Committee's inquiry into post-school educational needs provision. Uh, the submissions have been added to the inquiry folder on the SharePoint. And can I advise members that as the committee agreed to uh, convene the next week to receive a briefing on Steps to Success programme, uh, can the members indicate if they are able to attend? You'll remember that uh, Steps, <coughs> they're coming next week to uh, brief us on Steps to Success, and uh, we'll want to ensure that we have a quorum and a committee for that. 1130, Chairman. 11.30. 11.30, that is what agreed for. Yeah. Members can indicate they're able to attend. Uh, function at 10, but I should be here by, by 11.30. Okay. okay. <coughs> function? 10. Yeah, so that's... Yeah. <coughs> you can keep that in mind, uh, members. Can I also advise members that given we are going into summer recess, it is usual that the committee delegates authority to the chairperson and deputy chairperson to deal with any FOI requests during the recess period. It will be for the chairperson and deputy chairperson to submit views on releasing or withholding information if any, if any non-routine or contentious FOI uh, requests arise. If there are any such requests, the committee will be advised at the first meeting back in September. Agreed. All agreed? agreed. We have on to the draft minutes of the meeting, and you will find that <coughs> at page 6 of your packs. Uh, can we get agreement for the uh, minutes? Agreed. Members agreed? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Matters rising um, at page 12. And can we get uh, the agreed action points from the last committee <coughs> meeting as we have them? Uh, at that page on your packs. Any members, anything they wish to raise? No. All agreed? <coughs> Moving on to correspondence at page 16 and table. Um, at page 18, there's correspondence regarding the tapestry of colours uh, from the educational programme. This is something that was uh, brought forward or raised by Claire. Uh, Sutton, she's not here to uh, speak on it, but perhaps as a committee we should consider sending this um, correspondence on to the Education Committee for their information. Are members agreed? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. At page 28, 34 and page 68 there's a response from the University of Ulster and University of Ulster Students' Union and the NASUUSA relating to concerns raised by an individual regarding the governance of the University of Ulster Students' Union. And I would be seeking agreement from the members today to forward the responses <coughs> to the individual involved. All agreed? Okay. Tabled at page 8, there's correspondence from the Committee for Education to the Department for Employment and Learning regarding the General Teaching Council Northern Ireland's Bill. Uh, do members wish to schedule a joint meeting for, our, for a joint briefing uh, in the Forward <coughs> Works programme? Yeah. Joint briefing between, <coughs> the no the between the Education Committee and this committee. <coughs> okay, so we'll put that into the uh, Forward Work programme. Actions, all actions agreed as we have it there. <coughs> that Forward programme at page 83. 
and uh, you will see the draft programme up until the 24th of September 2014. Members should note that the meeting on the 17th of September will commence at 9 a.m. <coughs> to facilitate the five briefings from the institutions on the review of initial teacher uh, infrastructure that are scheduled for that meeting. Um, are members agreed with that? Commencing a meeting at 9 rather than 10? Agreed. Bring more packed lunches. <laughs> It'll be a long meeting, but whatever. Okay. And all, all, uh, run one, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Chair, can I go back to correspondence and just regarding the latest labour market statistics, is there any possibility of getting that broke down by council area or, or parliamentary the area? Council. Yeah. And council. could that be emailed to ourselves? Council area and constituency. Uh, well, either or, or all, whatever. <coughs> Yeah, I'm sure we can get that done, uh, Ronald. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> and can I advise members that all our, all, our, all our briefings may be scheduled as they arise? <coughs> all agreed? Yeah. We have a, sub a subordinate legislation, SR 2014 173, the Industrial Training Levy Construction. Industry Order Northern Ireland 2014, and you'll find that at page 85 of your packs. The Department laid a statutory rule on the 20th of June 2014. The statutory rule sets the levy on the construction industry, which allows the construction industry, training board construction skills NA, to fulfil its role of encouraging the <coughs> adequate training of those employed or intending to be employed in the construction industry in Northern Ireland. This legislation is similar to legislation in, in uh, GB, however the rate of the levy is agreed locally with the construction industry. The levy rate of 0.65% from the 1st of September 2014 is 0.05% up on the last year. There is also provision in the rule for exemption from the levy for small businesses. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution and is due to come into operation on the 31st of August 2014. The committee considered the proposal to make a statutory rule at its meeting on the 11th of June 2014 and agreed that it was content with the proposal. There has been no change to the policy content since the proposal was considered by the committee and the examiner of statutory rule has no issues, uh, has no issues to raise on the matter. Are members content with this rule? Content. Okay. I have to read out the following, that the Committee for Employment and Learning has considered SR 2014-173, <coughs> the Industrial Training Levy, Construction Industry Order, Northern Ireland 2014, and there's no objection to the rule. I hope we we'll move on to the briefing from the Vice Chancellor of Queen's University Belfast on his vision for the university. And I want to remind all members that this has been hand started and therefore all electronic devices should be switched off at this uh, point. At page 96 of your packs, you'll have the briefing paper on the Vice Chancellor's uh, vision for the university and also tabled at page 26, you have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome Professor Patrick uh, Johnson, the uh, President and Vice Chancellor of Queen's University to committee today. You're very welcome, sir. We're glad to have you here. And uh, we'll give you up to 10 minutes to do your presentation, give us your vision for the university, and then we'll open it up to questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair, <coughs> and my thanks to the committee for giving me this opportunity to outline uh, the vision that I have for the institution and what we have got begun to debate and work on over the last uh, three months in particular. Um, the vision is basically to create a world-class international university here in Belfast that supports outstanding students, no matter what their background is, and also staff working in world-class facilities, conducting leading-edge education and research but most importantly, very much focused on the needs of society, both here <coughs> and globally. What does that actually mean? What is a global uh, international university? Well, first of all, it's a university that's led by world-class leaders, world-class academics. It's one that has a culture that's imbued with leadership at all levels, that's focused on meritocracy, transparency, and conviction and ambition. 
Um, so in other words, being there really impacting not just here in Northern Ireland, but actually right across the world. It's also very importantly about supporting staff and students in developing the next generation of leaders for our society and also more globally as well. Um, and supporting students particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's also about driving <coughs> and supporting world-class research to advance knowledge and build understanding about people, communities and societies. That's what universities, modern universities and future universities need to be about. And finally, you can't do that unless you actually drive the exchange of knowledge that maximizes the intellectual, cultural, social and economic impact on society, beginning with your local society. Now, how do we go about um, achieving that? Well, first of all, Queen's is already an internationally very well-known university, one of the Russell Group of universities, um, and has very high standards. But you start as an or any organization with the culture. It isn't about buildings. It's about people. It's about staff. It's about students. And that culture has to be strong and unified. It has to be dynamic and innovative. And it has to be one that actually permeates uh, all sections of uh, the institution and beyond. It also has to be um, a leadership that actually empowers innovative academic and broader leadership alongside accountable academic performance. And one that rewards academic and administrative excellence and achievement. Now, when I use the word reward, I'm not talking about financial reward. I'm talking about recognition of real <coughs> excellence. But fundamentally, it's about a culture that uh, is about leadership, ambition, and conviction, and does not accept good enough. There is no good enough. It's that dynamic of innovation that actually searches for new knowledge and educates across new knowledge. How do we do that? Um, well, as with all universities, um, we must now strategically and selectively invest in very high quality areas. You can't, in a modern university, uh, fund everything, particularly at the top end. And so uh, one of the things that we're now debating is how we actually might develop interdisciplinary research institutes. So moving people away from discipline-based to the interfaces between disciplines where real innovation takes place. Those areas have to be financially viable. Um, and have to be areas that we have a comparative advantage based on the leaders and the skill sets that we have within them. Um, it also, as a, a development, must partner uh, with government, uh, particularly with yourselves, but also with governments internationally, also with industry and NGOs, and with other top global institutions. And we can come back to that later in question. Um, one of the areas that we're going to drive a real focus on is on the graduate level, so that's post-undergraduate. Queen's is, as I'll come to in a minute, a very good undergraduate university. In my view, um, it is not as good at the postdoctoral level. And the postdoctoral level and the graduate level, i.e. PhD level, is what defines and distinguishes universities across the world. Um, and I'll talk later about some of the ideas we have for how we go about that. But of course, these entities have to be inclusive um, in educating our undergraduates. Now, one of the things that Queen's has done very well over recent times is actually drive the quality of undergraduate student experience. Um, and that's not because I say so, it's because the students say so. Uh, in terms of student feedback, we are no now number 12 in the UK. Um, and this year, uh, we don't have the results yet, we've had uh, over an 81% return in the NSS, our highest ever. We must focus, however, in going forward on interdisciplinary cross-faculty school courses, again, moving away from just discipline-based um, to interfaces across disciplines in terms of undergraduate education. We also have to focus on efficiency, effectiveness, and most importantly, employability. Students need to know that what they do is going to lead to greater chances of actually having employment. Um, and that's something that we already do well. 93% of our students are in employment within six months or doing a further degree. 
Uh, we also have to focus on uh, e-learning and using technology, blended learning opportunities, uh, because that is shaping how education is actually going forward and is one of the big challenges to, uh, to educational institutions right across the world. Partnerships with industry within the curriculum. I was delighted to be able to announce in May partnership with PwC uh, in, uh, alongside our management courses uh, in uh, bringing forward curriculum that will allow our students to work with PwC for a year over a four-year course. And then developing global alliances that enhance the diversity of our student population. That will be a major goal to double at least the international population coming to Queen's. One of the most important aspects of any university is to be relevant and at the heart of its local society before it becomes relevant anywhere else. Um, and therefore, uh, its responsibilities to its community and to its society become first and foremost. And in doing that, uh, Queen's must have a strong relationship with our local political parties, local government and city council. Uh, and I very much welcome this meeting as part of that evidence of a strong relationship. The economic impact of Queen's is huge. Uh, for every one pound of public funding that we receive, we return seven to our local economy. I want to see that double. I also want to see us maximize the intellectual, cultural, and social and economic impact. So just not economic, that we actually look at the interplay between um, the cultural, social, and intellectual climate as well, because they will all add to that broader impact on society. Widening participation, clearly very, very important. Uh, currently, uh, in terms of Russell Group, we're at the top of the Russell Group. 31% of students coming to Queen's <coughs> belong to the lower socioeconomic groups. Um, that's not good enough, however, in my view. We need to be more visible within deprived social communities as an institution. And that's something that I won't talk about today, but I'm happy to take questions on. And also then developing special initiatives and partnerships with further education colleges. Um, and I've already begun discussions uh, with one such college <coughs> in that regard. <coughs> I mentioned earlier about the postgraduate culture, um, something we really need to work on, very important area, um, and one that in my view is deficient. Um, so what we are planning to do is develop a graduate school with dedicated courses for postgraduate taught and research. Um, that will go right across the institution. It will focus on promoting cooperation across academic um, disciplines and also enhance career development opportunities with industry and other partners. But it also will be a focus for internationalization. Um, over the last uh, three months, three and a half months, we've been debating this vision in detail. And what I haven't given you today, partly because of time, is some of the meat that's actually around this, and that will evolve as we go forward. Um, everyone agrees within the university that this strategy is exactly what Queen's needs to be doing. We set up three project groups to take forward the initial three elements of this around leadership and culture around university structures and around the development of a postgraduate culture that's fit for purpose. And the academics and individuals leading those are highlighted on this slide. Um, I have been communicating this vision widely. I have, at, at this point, met nearly 2,000 staff uh, within the institution. Um, I've been having widespread meetings with political leaders. I've met with all the political parties at this juncture, and also been meeting with community leaders. In May, um, we launched a vision website within the university, allowing um, staff to be able to give their comments, and over 60 staff have already done so. We've also <coughs> developed a vice chancellor's blog that picks up various themes, and the third of those was just released earlier this week. And over the next three to four months, we will uh, continue. I will continue with school and directorate visits, political meetings, feedback through the Vision website, and also um, the project groups will also continue to meet. So, just to summarise where we are on leadership values and principles. We absolutely agree that we must have a committed leadership that actually um, is focused on meritocracy and transparency, that aligns with this vision, that employs uh, and ensures the implementation of rigorous academic standards um, and allows world-class students, no matter what their background, to have access to the best world-class education that they can have, 
um, driven by world-class staff, underpinned by dynamic and innovative culture and curriculum, which ensures that it continues to change and further develop as new knowledge comes to the fore. Um, and that process is now being worked on over the next three months. <coughs> Similarly, around structures, uh, we have agreed that they should be interdisciplinary, they should align with the vision, and they should empower academic leadership and accountability. Um, and we've agreed we must create executive faculty structures, which we currently don't have, but also create distinctive world-class research institutes. And then finally, on the postgraduate end, we've agreed that this is an area that needs real focus. Um, we need to significantly increase our postgraduate research base and taught programs, and also increase and enhance the postdoctoral provision funded through increasing research income. Um, also, within the postgraduate vision, there will be a significant focus on internationalization and also partnership with industry, both here in Northern Ireland and globally. Um, and we've already agreed that a graduate school is the right way to take this forward. What are the keys to the <coughs> success of this vision? Well, first of all, a clear vision and strong and committed leadership right across the whole institution. Um, World-class students and staff, no matter what their background. A dynamic and innovative academic culture permeating every aspect of what we do. It is critical that we ensure government support and buy-in because this vision will not happen without that. It's also critical that we ensure the support and partnership of wider stakeholders whether it's our community groups, whether it's our schools, whether it's our businesses. Um, and absolutely emphatically and important is that we must ensure <coughs> what we prioritize and do has a local and also a global impact. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Professor. And uh, again, can I commend you on your vision for Queen's University, <coughs> keeping it up there as a world-class university. You did mention a postgraduate school that, that you were looking about developing. When do you foresee that that would be developed? Um, what we plan to do, Chair, is um, in September to October cycle of work, we will be taking an integrated plan to Senate for approval. <coughs> if Senate approves that, the initial components of this plan will begin. There will be a lot of further work to be done. Uh, at that point, we will start the formation of a graduate school. It won't become fully operational until academic year 15-16. Um, because we will have to appoint um, an academic dean to lead the graduate school. Um, we also then will be connecting the graduate school dendritically uh, to um, all of the faculties and all of the schools um, and operationalizing the administration around it as well. So it will take us several months to actually get all of that uh, completed. So it won't become fully operational until academic year 15-16. And as you have looked at your vision to take, to take this forward, uh, obviously, you know, no matter what you go to do, there are always going to be challenges, there are going to be difficulties, there are going to be pitfalls. H have you looked to see what may be the challenges and the difficulties that you may face as you seek to take your vision forward? I think there are many challenges, Chair. Um, I think the first challenge is to bring the broad constituency of the academic and other leadership within the university with you. That's why, uh, as I've said, I've already spoken to over 1,800 staff. Um, I've made the vision very, very transparent. I've extended the period for consultation to um, the end of September. Um, initially, we were going to do it until the end of June to allow greater interaction and feedback from all quarters. Um, so that's the first challenge, is to, to ensure significant buy-in. And of course, in doing that, we're going to find there are challenges, but also opportunities, because people will come up with some suggestions that we hadn't thought about. Um, <clears throat> I think the other challenge, then, is actually beginning to understand what I'm talking about. Um, it's not, you know, words have to be translated. Global <coughs> standards, you know, a top-class institution. Uh, means that the behaviours, the culture around that has to actually aspire to that level of conviction and ambition. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, right across the whole institution because it has benefits to all of society. The third thing then is actually the partnership with major stakeholders, importantly yourselves, um, because in the absence of government funding for this, this will not happen. I'm not saying that government would fund all of this. But um, our people are our only resource in Northern Ireland. 
And unless we actually invest in those, we will not actually see the type of return in society that we all want. Um, and that's why I made the comment that the leverage function around what we do um, for every pound of government money we spend, we want to see, you know, currently we return seven, but I'd like to see that double. And we double that by driving the quality agenda and the networking that actually comes with it. Well, do you, do you, and, and finally, before we open up, do you see that this, do you see this, that it'll open up the demand for more students to be coming to Queen's? <clears throat> I think the answer to that is yes. It will certainly increase the competition um, uh, because it <clears throat> what attracts people from outside to go to global universities is that they have um, greater options in terms of their career development. <clears throat> so it accelerates that. Um, people want to go to institutions that actually allow them to develop uh, in a world-class way. Um, so that sort of level of competition <clears throat> will absolutely go up. And numbers, I think, will follow that. Um, if, if I was to extend and evolve that, however, um, I think the biggest increase in terms of the type of students that I want to see proportionately is at the postgraduate level, where we, because we're underperforming there. Uh, currently, 23% of students at Queen's are postgraduates. I would like to see that closer to 35 to 40%, because that not only is good for the postgrads, it actually also is very good for the undergraduate programs. Okay. Pat? <coughs> Thanks, sir. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning, Pat. Um, wishing you every success as a dairyman to another dairyman. Uh, I think people in the city are certainly delighted and proud that someone has got to that Vice Chancellor of Queen's. I'm clear that there's absolutely no doubt, Chair, that Queen's the economic driver um, and dividend particularly to Belfast in terms of onward investment, especially, is immense. Is immense. I suppose that's why those in the city have been articulating for so long the rationale for the increased numbers at McGee. But I'm not going to ask you a question on that. I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to, to see someone who, who chairs the all-party group on disability, um, how Queen's are going to encourage greater access or widening participation for the student body, and how those with <coughs> disabilities can access the student support programmes that's the incentive for them to, to go to third level, Queen's. Well, I think this is a really important issue. I mean, first of all, we look very good uh, in terms of our overall widening participation numbers as a Russell Group University, but I think we could do even better. And I, I think one of the things that we could begin to do better is by working with schools in an integrated way to look for opportunities to, m because in certain parts of our society, Queen's is, might as well be in a different country or a different planet. Um, and so we need to create an aspiration early on uh, at primary school level, in my view, uh, where people would aspire to, to actually going to university, whether it's Queen's or anywhere else. Um, we, um, as you probably know, have formed a senior and junior academy to start taking forward that process. Um, and that's already, in my view, beginning to have some success. I think we need to link, you know, encouraging our staff to become governors of schools, to be people who are from certain areas that uh, may be uh, economically disadvantaged, that, you know, they give back to those communities because they've been privileged. Um, it's no accident that one of the first things I did as Vice Chancellor was go to my primary school. It's a very deliberate thing on my part. Uh, I probably should have done it a long time ago in some ways. Um, but I think we do have a responsibility because those of us who've been fortunate to benefit from a third level education and all that that then brings um, are privileged and we have to uh, develop a culture within the university that actually recognises that privilege and actually wishes to give back to society. So that's something we're actively working on. I haven't talked about that programme today. I'll be happy to come back at a later point and talk about some of those ideas. But they involve working more closely with schools, building on the academies that I've talked about, uh, uh, building and expanding the homework clubs, uh, which recently won the Business and Community Awards, uh, where students are working with the primary schools. 
um, and this year close to 200 students have already signed up. I want to see that expanded very significantly. I also think we have to work very closely uh, within Belfast with the City Council um, in a way that uh, really uh, together looks at some of these issues about how we work in partnership and indeed with the University of Ulster as well in partnership around some of these issues. So those are just some of the ideas um, that I have. Chair, the final question is just that the relevance in the modern society to STEM related subject matters is key. And this committee has been hosting a number of events and participating in events that's <coughs> promoting and advocating STEM. How do you see that diversify and taking the point that there's a huge immense research going on on health and well being, for example, and we, we are at five star on that. So how do you how do you see that the STEM subjects being more available and accessible for so STEM is our top priority, as is, which will not surprise you, and um, we're very grateful for the enhanced funding, and indeed we have enhanced the number of slots ourselves with some of our own funding to enhance um, uh, the availability of STEM. Um, so in subjects like physics, computer science, um, we've seen very significant increases now in our overall numbers over the last uh, three years in particular, and that is going to continue. Um, importantly, we've also, however, begun to connect that to employability. So yeah. where some of these programs are um, now connected to Liberty IT, to um, PwC, to um, Allstate. So we're, we're actually broadening the dimension of the experience that our students <coughs> get um, as part of that education within STEM. Um, and as you know, employers are crying out for even more numbers. There's always a tension in this because you, we also have to be careful that we don't over and um, focus on this and imbalance the humanities to the degree that actually is harmful because humanities and social sciences are really important for our society because they are going to contextualize um, the advances that come from technology within society. That's how we debate governance, that's how we debate ethics, that's how we shape society in some ways. Um, so there is a tension there and I acknowledge that, but certainly as an institution we are fully committed to the STEM agenda. We recognize its importance for the economy, we recognize the, its importance for the global economy and we want to be players in that. Thank you. Okay, Pat, thank you. David Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, sure. and <coughs> very welcome, Patrick, and wish you well with the task ahead. And it really was around that sort of topic that Pat had touched upon, and you, know, you spoke about and trying to get into some of the sort of the socially deprived communities in, in Northern Ireland. I certainly worked with, with others in the provision of higher and further education who have attempted to do that, and it has been very successful, I have to say. And, it's probably maybe even reached into to communities where by sometimes it was politically very difficult to, and, and it has sort of breached uh, those, those, those gaps. I was just wondering, if you obviously mentioned special initiatives, and it is sort of very early on. Uh, is there anything further you can tell us on that? At this well, point? I, I think this is where, uh, well, first of all, the homework clubs, if I take that as a concrete example of something that's up and running, um, I think I'd like to see that expanded very significantly. So this is where our students, um, are actually working with primary school both early on and also um, uh, in primary six seven um, and actually helping them with homework so one of the things that we've begun to discuss is well can we start to work with the parents and the children together um, and how would we do that so that's something that's actively being thought about currently um, I've met with uh, May Blood to talk about specific issues related to the Shankill, and we'll be meeting again in July. Is there ways that we can become come in there and get students or young people at primary school coming to Queens for sports activities, for uh, go to the QFT for an afternoon? You know, so use the facilities there, and and uh, in a way that. Um, uh, gets rid of the myth that you can never actually come to a place like this and in a sense makes it more um, joined up with um, the aspirations I suppose and the hope that that can actually encourage in, in young children and I, I, I you know think we do that sort of thing you know throughout society if we can um, I also think um, I, I'd like to see more of our staff becoming governors in um, our primary schools and particularly in disadvantaged areas, and in particular if they come from those areas. Because that's why I made the emphasis on, well, here's how you give back. 
And then I think working more closely with our further education colleges. Um, so we have attention because we, I'm, I'm I mean, absolutely clear, it's a global world-class education. So, um, and that tension is that we have to maintain standards. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we have to close the door on people who've been disadvantaged and who haven't had the opportunities that others have had or who are late bloomers, if I could put it that way. So, for example, in medicine this year, for the first time, um, virtually the final thing I did as Dean of Medicine was um, <clears throat> uh, ignore GCSEs for people who come from SE groups five to seven. Um, and outside of maths and English, they have to pass those. But we focus on AS levels. And so if they get an A or B at AS, we will interview them if they come from those areas. So, um, and I think more creative programs like that uh, are some things that we should be thinking about. But equally, I think working closely with further education colleges uh, will also increase the opportunities in widening participation. So, so it's a range of things, David. I, I was going to follow up with the excellent sports facilities that you have, and hopefully those can come in to Absolutely. Well. In, in actual fact, that's already... So we just, this week, uh, or last week, excuse me, we had the certificate giving in 04 for the kids who've been on the initial homework clubs programme, so that was one of the activities they got to, to see the sports facilities. Thank you. OK. Sammy? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for your presentation, Patrick, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Sammy. Your new career. Um, last week I attended the, is it the commencement uh, in the uh, St Mary's University College. Uh, I met a lot of the, the students there, uh, very, very impressed. And it's great because a number of them was the, the first, time, first person in their family had actually yeah. went through St Mary's and they were looking forward to their graduation uh, um, <coughs> this week. And, uh, and also um, I would be involved with some groups over in Sandra and with David. Um, so they've had a very good relationship with, um, with you, I think, with uh, Professor uh, Tony Gallagher uh, as well. Um, but come back, back to the whole the, the about St Mary's, and uh, obviously there was a, the review of initial uh, teacher training and this week. Um, would, you, would you be free to maybe pass a few comments um, on that, or have you had, had you had time to read the report? Well, I haven't had time to read the report. I mean, it just came out, as you know, uh, yesterday. Um, and so I just would comment that I very much welcome the report, um, and I think it obviously points to uh, some of the challenges that we have in terms of uh, teacher education. Um, and the view of the university, in our view, is that we have to create a world-class educational program for teachers. Um, there are a number of options that have been presented, and uh, when we at Queen's have a time to digest those and think about those, we will obviously be back in September. But we uh, very much come from the view that developing the highest quality uh, educational system for training our teachers and lifelong learning. So also then enhancing that with research um, and other things into a lifelong learning and making it a, a, a place where you get the most competent and competitive people going in where they're actually getting employed and of course the report points to those. So we would sign up to all of that um, and I look forward to the debate around this you know, in September when that goes forward. And finally, just come back to I think what Pat had already mentioned on David, in terms of um, working with you know potential students from from disadvantaged areas. And I saw we had a big song parade in East Belfast last night, and it just struck me that the huge numbers of young people involved in bands. And I thought there's an absolutely excellent opportunity if you want to try and contact or make you know access. And many, I would know a number of those young men, young people um, who have literally no hope in life in terms of, of a job um, or the, the, the low aspirations. So um, be very keen for you to come back and maybe um, I, I think you're, you're going to do it at some stage anyway and then tell us maybe some of the work that you're doing and what you're proposing to do. Yeah, well, so sure. just to, I mean, not that I can go into the details because we're, we're just at the start of this, but the university is already engaged, um, but I think we could do even more and make it more visible. So one of the things that I've asked one of my colleagues to um, take forward is the development of a social charter that would actually in, go in parallel with what I'm talking about here. And that comes back to the culture. If the culture is one of giving back, everybody actually benefits. 
agriculture will then drive its own excellence, if you understand me. Um, so I think having a lot of this underpinned by activities that relate to a social charter for the university uh, will actually produce great benefits, both for the university, for its staff, for the students, um, but also for society. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Sammy. We're moving on to Fra, but before we move there, folk, we've got word from the um, Hansard folk that there's interference or somebody must, mustn't have their uh, mobile phones or something switched off. So could you check that all, all your equipment is switched off so that uh, these folk uh, don't have any interference within the recordings? Fra. Yes, <coughs> sure. And, and again, Patrick, thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation. It's, it's certainly interesting. And, uh, the difficulties about coming fit in the lane of asking questions. I know a lot of questions that you were going to ask them already. Even, uh, mm. thing. But uh, it certainly is interesting. You, you said at the start of the presentation that uh, up to 92 per cent of uh, people uh, go on to work. Is that locally, or is that how, how many of those would be actually uh, heading abroad? Uh, I actually I don't know the answer to that. I can't give you the specific number, and certainly I'll follow mm. up and find that out. So around about 73 per cent go into direct employment. Um, and uh, and then the remainder actually go in to do further education, you know, master's programs or PhDs. So that's the sort of breakdown that I can give. Um, uh, so, but I think the important thing is that for us is we we intend to drive up the employability agenda, and that is challenging. Um, and for me, it's about how we bring um, the employers closer to some of the programs that we have. <coughs> Um, and th that doesn't matter whether it's history, English or whatever, there are still plenty of areas um, that our students can be going and doing things in. So for example, um, there are a number of students now in the New York Stock Exchange, I want to see that number you know, significantly increased, but they come from a variety of different disciplines. Um, uh, there's the Washington Ireland program that has been very successful uh, in terms of uh, work placement and now we have joint degrees with PwC starting for the first time this year and I'd like to see those expanded you know with other companies um, and obviously where we have relationships as we do with local companies um, whether it's Citigroup whether it's Almac, Randox or whatever we actually drive those partnerships forward as well. Thank you. To, to see in, in, in terms of talking about um, providing a global institution, um, where would your target audience be? Would it be in America or would it, or would it be a number of countries throughout the world? It's a number of countries. Um, so America will certainly be one of those. Um, and we, in November, uh, will be announcing uh, the development of a Queen's College in China. <coughs> in Shenyang in partnership with the Chinese Medical University delivering pharmaceutical technology uh, degrees and, and pharmacy. Um, we're currently working on a set of proposals for a Queen's Academy in India linking to four northeastern universities and also um, an institute of technology in Delhi. Um, and uh, later this year we'll also make that public once we have that finalised and agreed. Um, so there are some very concrete initiatives that we're, we're actually working on. We also have a programme now in South America with Brazil uh, where we're recruiting people at both a PhD, Masters and indeed even undergraduate level uh, over the course of the last 18 months and I would like to see an, an further initiatives there expanded. I've met with the uh, presidents of three American universities uh, already in the last two months including Notre Dame and um, Michigan State University and uh, you know so I, I'm looking at partnerships with US institutions where we would have um, the potential for our students moving there and vice versa and indeed in some of those looking at how we might even do combined degree programs so there's a number of different initiatives here on the international front uh, some of which is about uh, putting uh, our stamp internationally and being physically present um, uh, but also very much connected back to here, back to Queen's and Belfast, uh, but also then in partnership with other institutions. The other conversations are in terms of uh, the island. I, I mean, I've already met with the president of Trinity College and also with uh, University College Cork to look at you know, how can we effectively do things together uh, rather than, you know, 
seeing something on paper that really doesn't produce results. So can we expand the SFP <coughs> program, DEL programs? Uh, can we, we have an academy with UCD and Trinity? Are there, you know, how well is that actually performing? That's one of the questions I have. Can we build on that and create um, uh, broader relationships across the university infrastructure on the island? Sure, and the, the, the final question, and again, it goes back to the, 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 the old question of working within associated private communities, having to believe that, you know, education is the greatest thing in the world and it offers the greatest opportunities to people. And I think one of the ways that if you ever to defeat poverty and deprivation, a uh, pathway through education is, is probably the, the, the best way of doing it. I represent West Belfast that probably has uh, the most socially depraved uh, elements of, of communities within it. And it's to, uh, just interested in how Queen's uh, would, would work with them. Uh, to I know that, uh, and I, I do appreciate that, uh, that the, 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 the homework clubs uh, have, been, have been excellent. Uh, but there's a whole world outside uh, the, 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 the schools. You know, and there are quite a number of people who are involved in neighbourhood renewal partnerships, involved in uh, uh, partnership boards at a greater level. How do you work well, with them? I, I think what we need to do is actually look at those partnerships where we can actually contribute to them and actually add real value. Um, work with community groups, whether it's in West Belfast, East Belfast, or uh, whether it's beyond Belfast, you know, it doesn't have to be in Belfast. I think we, we should be contributing where that is meaningful um, to um, the development of society and to the hope and opportunities that are there for our young people. So um, <clears throat> that's the basis for <clears throat> coming forward with the social charter, is that we actually see that as a responsibility as a university and flag that right up front saying we have you know, we have a responsibility, a duty, if you like, to actually deliver on this. I think the programs themselves will probably differ in different locations. I think they're, you know, to be shaped in part <clears throat> by what the local community needs are, as opposed to, you know, us as a university dictating there, because, uh, you know, we, we don't have that level of connectivity in terms of need. Um, so I think it's important that we're engaged in those conversations um, at many different levels. Well, some of the ideas that I have relate to how we influence <coughs> education per se, you know, in terms of um, uh, the uh, primary school and secondary school agenda and working with students directly, but also working in terms of how programs might get shaped. Um, and then, uh, you know, if there are things, whether it's economic drivers, whether it's, you know, small biotech companies setting up, whether it's that type of business liaison that we can start to do as an institution, looking at those types of things as well. Well, just, just, just one, one thing. I think it's an excellent idea in terms of people going on the Board of Governors, but and that's been considered. There are a number of primary schools I thought to put through the meeting of Irish, and uh, with Ticket Day will be included in. Well, Jimmy Shinnock is Hanning show, sure, you know. I mean, the bottom line is, you know, why wouldn't they be, you know? No. I mean, I don't see that uh, a medium of Irish or any other language would exclude. It's it's about the educational process, you know? You know, so. Thank you. Hey, Bronwyn. Okay, thank you, Patrick, and I want to wish you all the best for the very future. Um, just on the back of Fra's point, um, you know, just regarding the homework clubs and what connections do you have with other areas outside of Belfast? I represent from on South Tyrone. We have two neighbourhood renewal areas, one in Inniskillen, one in Dungannon. I, in particular, represent the Dungannon area, but we also have a significant growth of the ethnic minority population. And how do you deal with those type of barriers as well, in, regarding language, you know, at the, the homework club level? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, the, the honest answer is I don't know the answer, you know, but <clears throat> is it something we should be exploring? Yes. I mean, I, I think that the concept, um, the homework clubs, as you will know, was really just a pilot project. It's only been in existence for the last year. Um, well, close to 200 students this year have already signed up, which just shows you the appetite our students have for it. Um, so I think we've got to build on its success, and I agree with you entirely. It shouldn't be seen as Belfast-centric, um, and um, it should be seen as something that we can deliver elsewhere. It's getting the funding for it, you know, is, is, the, is the challenging thing. So that's one of the targets I have, is to try to double the amount of funding that we actually can get into it so that we can 
create those opportunities. Um, on the uh, languages side, on the culture side, I think that's one of the areas we could potentially really add value to because we have such a diverse um, set of educational programs, both around social sciences, uh, cultural diversity, and obviously languages and creative languages themselves. So, so I think there is something we could really contribute to there, whether that's upskilling teachers. Um, so the uh, department has just provided us with um, funding to upskill computer science teachers. Um, and that's great because uh, one of the challenges that uh, teachers have is that the curriculum is changing quickly and the needs, so where you expand a STEM program, it's fine to say that, but in actual fact, if you don't within secondary schools or grammar schools have the educational basis foundation to take those on, that's a real challenge. So, and in the same way, I could see that if there were particular pockets where we needed to enhance language skills or um, communication skills in different languages, that's something where we could really contribute. Thank you. Okay, Ambassador. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Johnson, for your, your presentation. And, and I too obviously want to wish you well at your, you, at your new role. Um, you mentioned earlier the tension there is, or perhaps the, the balance that has to be struck between the social sciences and seeing the university as um, perhaps providing courses that are directly relevant to the needs of the, the economy. Um, and you mentioned the, the global institution idea, and we obviously all live in a global world, and it's important that Queen's is seen as a global force. But in that global wor world, obviously, jobs are incredibly mobile, and what we want to see perhaps is the university as an economic driver, and yeah. perhaps that's where the focus, rightly or wrongly, is from, from, from Stormont. Um, and on the back of some of the stuff that Fra was talking about in terms of your connections with, with the U.S., and we obviously have a number of U.S. companies now investing in Northern Ireland, and it's great that the university is working very closely with them in R&D and things like that. But in terms of looking for future needs or future investment, can you give us an idea of, of the type of work that universities involved in or will be involved uh, in with some of the companies that maybe aren't here at present um, who are crying out for particular skills of young people? And it's a potential for us in Northern Ireland to, to get those skills here so that we can continue to attract those types of jobs and big companies here that will obviously benefit us economically in the future. And perhaps some of the, the linkages that you have with Invest Northern Ireland and the work that they do in with potential investors and how you can then come in the back of that and provide the skills that, that they're looking for in order to make the investment here? Well, um, thank you very much for that question. It's a really, really important area and it's certainly something that's a top priority for me. Um, and it, just in terms, I'll start off with the INI relationship. So just last week we had bio in San Diego in the United States and um, uh, our Minister Arlene Foster was there along with um, Alistair Hamilton and uh, a number of people from Queen's were there. There are two companies directly as a result of that uh, who are looking to relocate. You know, uh, discussions have already started about relocating to Belfast. Why? Because the expertise um, uh, sits here now that they happen to be health-related companies and health biotech-related companies. But um, uh, so, so that's just to give you um, an example of what happens uh, when you actually build world-class facilities and have world-class people who are recognized. Um, and I think this is the why I'm really challenging the university, because um, it, the university does some things very well in this sector. It is the leading UK um, knowledge um, technology partner uh, <coughs> university, so um, and outdoing uh, Cambridge, Oxford, Edinburgh, you know, and so so we have some very strong bases to build on. Um, however, what we have to importantly say is we can't do everything, and even from a Northern Ireland PLC point of view, you can't do everything. So what, what is it that Queen's can actually really deliver? Well, it's going to be in areas around STEM, cyber security, it's going to be around um, a healthy living world, you know, clean water, safe food, you know, those are some of the big, and of course health um, is also going to be a big landmark uh, area for us. And I think this is part of what I'm driving at in terms of at the postgraduate level, really focusing, not that you're going to exclude everything else, but those things that are truly world class, you're really going to drive because they will drive those networks and that sort of um, connectivity that you talk about. Part of that connectivity and part of how we do research in the modern world, as some of you may know, I, I sit 
on the MRC board nationally and, and chair the whole translational research strategy nationally. Um, and part of that is actually driving partnerships with industry globally, but also in the UK, um, where we actually do things together increasingly. <clears throat> and that is a challenging thing to do because we're partnering public money alongside private investment, um, but uh, it certainly is uh, going to be the way that future societies actually develop innovation, develop products, because academia can only take a product to a certain point. In actual fact, it'll kill the product if it tries to develop it because it doesn't have the commercial expertise. It's then that it needs partnership to get it across what's called the valley of death to make the technology or the discovery relevant to society. Um, and that's what I want to see us do, is have open innovation centres that actually allow industry into those, much like you see in Titanic, um, and that those then become centres of excellence globally, uh, where both industry, other universities, and indeed governments want to work with us. Thanks. Okay, Claire. Hi. Um, uh Thanks for your presentation. Sorry, I missed the first part of it. And again, I wish you well in your work going forward. Um, I suppose one of the biggest frustrations I'm hearing, and you've probably already alluded to this, is um, graduates, you know, finishing their degree and you know, there's no work for them. Personally, I believe the key to that is experience. Um, and you alluded again to the, the Washington Ireland program, which I'm delighted about because I was both a student and a manager on that program. Um, so I suppose my question is, how do we weave experience programs like the Washington Ireland program into courses so that students are, you know, coming to the end, graduating and having some experience to make them more competitive in the by by doing exactly that, build, you know, building on that model, uh, and this is where the partnership with industry is really important. Not just with industry, by the way, but with government. I mean, I know that you've had somebody interning with the committee, you know, driving more of that, so that people are getting real experience. Uh, as dean of medicine, I had people working with me for three months, you know, shadowing me, so seeing what a dean of medicine did. Uh, the same thing is happening in the health service locally for some of our students. But but I think we need to make that much more formal. We've got Student Plus, which actually gives additional credits to students, which you will know about, um, and acknowledges a lot of the broader range of activities that students do. Uh, but I think within curriculum, and there is some pushback, you know, from academics in this regard, that you know we're actually <coughs> sullying the sort of discipline by allowing industry in. But I think we have a responsibility to really deliver on that, where. Um, <coughs> Our students are either having three-month um, attachments with industry or possibly a joint degree programs for where they work with them for a year across, let's say, three years or even one final year. And then they are actually going to get a job if they get a good enough grade and um, they you know, pass everything. And so those are the types of things I'm looking at. The PwC program is the first of those that actually guarantees a job to someone if they get a 2-1 and if uh, um, they have been chosen by PwC at the start. So it's not at the end, it's at the start. If you get into the programme, if you're one of the chosen and you get a 2-1, two, two you'll actually get a job, but you'll be working with PwC. Liberty IT and Citigroup are actually uh, doing the same thing with a different model. Again, they're going to guarantee jobs so to an, a number of those students. Um, and so that's, I'd like to see that type of approach expanded, but equally I would like to see the types of programs that associate with the Washington Ireland program or with the New York Scholars program expanded to Boston, <coughs> San Francisco, uh, to Singapore, to other major cities around the world. Okay, that seems to be all of our questions. Patrick, can I thank you for coming here to committee today and for sharing your vision with us for Queen's and certainly we wish you well on your post and every success in the future. Thank you and very no much. doubt we'll look forward to hearing from you again in the future at some stage. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, our next briefing is a departmental briefing um, on the Higher Skills Survey 2013. You will find that at page 101 and page 111 of your packs. And can I welcome uh, Mr. Michael Gould, Deputy Director of the Skills Authority, and Mr. Victor Duclo, Deputy Director of the Elastic Services. Uh, we're glad to have you here today. And uh, you have 10 minutes to do your presentation for us, and then uh, we'll open up for questions.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Um, and thanks for those words of introduction uh, and the invitation to present uh, the information from the Northern Ireland uh, results, the Northern Ireland results of the latest UK uh, employer skills survey. I think it's worth pointing out that prior to this uh, UK CES survey being uh, produced, um, each country of uh, the UK had its own employer. Uh, skills survey. In Northern Ireland, we had the Northern Ireland Skills Monitoring Survey, which has been in existence since about 2003. Um, uh, but there are other similar surveys in England, Wales, uh, and Scotland. Uh, actually, we were uh, in Northern Ireland the catalyst for pushing for a more harmonised approach to all of this, uh, feeling that we would be able to get better comparability of where we sit in the broader uh, context, but also, of course, the, the possibility of a for scale in, in terms of conducting all of this uh, work. Uh, so this UK-wide survey uh, provides a significant uh, evidence base on skills and adds uh, to the stock of knowledge that we are able to derive from uh, other sources, including labour market statistics uh, and wider skills research, uh, for example. Um, if you're content, I plan to uh, speak to a number of slides which we yeah. uh, sent, uh, I think, to the committee uh, previously, um, along with some background briefing paper uh, in advance of today's meeting. There's, there's a, a lot of information here, so we'll try and uh, push our way uh, through that, if that's okay, yeah, okay. with you. Um, just by way of background, this survey was conducted in quarter two, 2013. Uh, it was led, as I say, by the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. It involves, over across the UK, over 90,000 interviews uh, with uh, employers, and indeed it lays claim uh, to being the largest uh, employer skills survey in the world. Uh, around 4,000 employers in Northern Ireland participated in the survey. Uh, and the survey is designed to be representative of the economy, whether by sector or employer size uh, or occupation. Uh, this is the second time this particular UK CES survey has been uh, conducted, the first being in 2011. Uh, so it means that we're now in a position that we can start to compare uh, progress over time and how skill needs are, uh, in terms of the employer perspective, are developing and, and uh, how that picture unfolds. Uh, this survey provides a detailed picture of the skills landscape from the employer's perspective, as I say, and it considers a number of things, including uh, the extent to which employers have vacancies. Um, it asks then of those employers that do have vacancies, which of those vacancies were difficult to fill because of skills shortages among the applicants uh, to the vacancies. It asks whether skills gaps exist amongst current employees within employers. It asks uh, what employers are doing to upskill their employees where there are skills gaps and how much they are investing in that drive. And it really it asks employers as well to rate uh, their new recruits, and particularly those that have joined uh, the labour market recently after leaving education and training, uh, which is of particular interest uh, to the department, as you would mm -hmm. imagine. Moving then on to the uh, actual results and how they relate to Northern Ireland, slide three, uh, which I hope you can see in your pack, shows that about 10% uh, of employers in Northern Ireland reported that they had vacancies uh, at the time of the survey. Uh, the survey estimates that the vacancy rate in Northern Ireland equates to about 2.1 per cent of total employment at the time of the survey. So a vacant, two vacancies effectively for every uh, 100 uh, employees. That's about at the time of the survey, and it's, it's not over the year, it's just at the specific time that the survey uh, was conducted. That relates to about 16 to 17,000 vacancies uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, that's broadly the same proportion of employers reporting vacancies as the last time the survey was conducted. And if you look at the, the graph, you can see that Northern Ireland employers were less likely to report vacancies uh, than other parts uh, of the UK. And I think this is likely to reflect the very particular issues that we've been uh, working our way through uh, as a consequence of the economic downturn. And uh, we're aware uh, now that the economic news is improving uh, of late. Um, but we know also that we have been slower than other parts of the UK to find our feet in terms of that uh, recovery. 
Moving on to slide four, then the survey asks those employers that had vacancies about the extent to which they found those vacancies to be difficult to fill, at least in part uh, because they couldn't source the skills needed to fill uh, the post. And slide four shows that in Northern Ireland, about one fifth of employers with vacancies, so that's about one fifth of the 10% I spoke about uh, earlier, identified that the post was vacant because of a skills uh, shortage. Now that's lower than 2011 uh, and now also lower than other parts uh, of the UK. And I, as we reflect on this, I think in some respects uh, this reflects well on the interventions that are being delivered to meet skill needs here in Northern Ireland. Uh, but I think it's also, and we need to take this into account, likely to be a reflection of the specific economic weaknesses that we uh, have, and that in some areas it remains a, somewhat of a, a buyer's market uh, in, the, in the labour market. Um, Whenever you drill down a little bit into this, we find that it's the skilled trades and associate professional uh, occupations that our employers are finding most difficult uh, to fill because of skill shortages. Uh, and if you look at it by sector, uh, skill shortage vacancies are reported to be most prevalent within the agriculture sector, although the sample size is a little bit small there, uh, hotels and restaurants, and the community and social activities uh, sectors. There's an opportunity for employers within this survey um, with skill shortage vacancies to identify what skills they're finding difficult uh, to source. So if you have a, a difficult to fill vacancy because of a skills need, you're then asked, well, why was that difficult to fill? What skills did, could you not find? Um, and slide five shows that top uh, amongst the list is technical and practical skills. So these are often very job specific uh, type skills and they'll differ according to the occupation and sector that we're dealing with. But employers then go on to uh, state a whole range of softer skills that they're finding lacking amongst their, the applicants for jobs. And these are particularly things like planning organisation, problem solving, uh, communication, customer handling, team working skills. And these are, are uh, skill areas that you'll be uh, familiar with in terms of those soft, softer skills areas. I know that these are areas uh, skills providers are seeking uh, to develop uh, via curricular development uh, in Northern Ireland. Maybe we'll return to that uh, in, in the questioning. In terms of uh, skills gaps then, so that's all about vacancies and skill shortages amongst applicants. If we th turn now to thinking through uh, about the skills gaps amongst employees that are currently uh, in the labour market, um, survey asks employers about those skills that might be lacking amongst their current employees. Slide six shows that employers were less likely to report skills gaps uh, amongst uh, their employees. Indeed, around 86% of employers here considered that their entire workforce are fully proficient for the kind of work that they are required uh, to undertake. However, the proportion of employers reporting skills gaps has increased slightly since the 2011 uh, survey. Again, drilling down here, employers report that skills gaps were most prevalent uh, amongst sales staff, uh, machine operatives, and in skilled trades again. Um, slide seven then, and similar to before, uh, employers are reporting that the type of skills that are lacking tend to be those job specific ones, uh, but also the softer skills. So a similar message, I think, to, to that that was reported for uh, skill shortage vacancies. The survey also asks employers about investment in skills uh, development and encouragingly uh, the message uh, about the importance of skills seems to be getting some traction in Northern Ireland. Slide 8 shows that employers here are more likely than anywhere else in the UK uh, to believe that skills have an impact on performance. And I think that's a, that's a positive message. It, it suggests that the, uh, that the, the, the um, concept that skills is important for the future is getting through uh, and getting traction. However, whenever you set against this picture, and if we move on to slide nine, uh, it shows that fewer employers here uh, than elsewhere have taken steps to address skills gaps amongst their uh, employees. And while our employers are investing a substantial amount, about 1.1 
uh, billion in training and development, uh, and that's more than twice the amount those employers are investing in things like R&D, for instance, so it's a, it's a big uh, investment. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we can see from slide 10 uh, that this equates to around £1,500 of uh, skills investment per employee, which is about 6% less than the UK uh, total. So employers see skills as important, yet they're investing less in upskilling than other parts of the UK. And this is, I think, something of a conundrum, uh, but one maybe uh, that can be answered again by reflecting on the type of economy that we have in Northern Ireland. And it's really one, I think we'll be familiar with this, which is more low value added type than we would aspire to. Uh, and in other words, uh, it, Perhaps employer, employers are investing rationally here uh, in terms of the types of markets that they're competing in, uh, in terms of skills development. But you know also that the economic and skills strategies, uh, working in partnership with stakeholders, are seeking to move us on as an economy uh, so that we can rebalance uh, towards higher value, export oriented uh, employer and employer base. And then, really finally, moving on to the preparedness of young people uh, entering the, the labour market for the first time and how employers find their skill sets. Uh, looking specifically at those, it's clear uh, that, uh, and again, this is an area, as I said, of particular interest to the department. Slide 11 shows that employers here are more likely than UK employers to say that they are satisfied with the skills of their recent recruits, uh, especially those that have been recruited from HE uh, and FE. And again, that's uh, encouraging. So just to conclude, really, um, clearly the Employer Skills Survey is presenting us with a wealth of information about skills needs and employer uh, engagement with the skills agenda. Uh, that information is being put to good use uh, it's being used to inform the Ministerial Skills Action Groups, for example, on ICT, agri-food and advanced manufacturing uh, areas uh, that are important uh, for rebalancing our economy. It has been used to craft industry fact sheets that aid uh, the career service uh, and to shape people's career choices. Uh, it's being used to inform policy development, including the apprenticeship uh, review, and it has helped in the identification of priority skill areas in Northern Ireland. Um, so the findings in terms of dissemination are being, uh, are being shared widely by, uh, by the UK CES. And the UK CES launched a Northern Ireland toolkit earlier in June. Uh, and uh, it's a, an engaging product. Uh, and I think I've put a link to that in your packs uh, in, in terms of getting the messages uh, across to wider stakeholders. Uh, we also engaged with the UK CES to run a successful event in June. Uh, which discussed the findings of the survey with key stakeholders, including employers, providers and employee representatives. And we're working with the UK KCES currently uh, to see how this source of information can be further developed uh, and harnessed uh, to cast further light on the skills landscape here. Um, that's really all I wanted to say at this point, um, but if there are any questions. Do you, Michael, did you want to...? Oh, thank you, Chairman. Just ready to reinforce what Victor has said. This is a very good snapshot at a time. Uh, hopefully, the, the economy continues to recover, and the, we recognise that there are skills needs there with employers. We continue to work with them, and hopefully, uh, we'll be showing an improved picture in the years ahead. Thank you. I'm going to open it up for questions, um, Alistair. Thanks, Chair. I think it is useful in terms of providing that snapshot, as you say, in terms of where, where the gaps are at the moment. Um, I suppose economies change that rapidly now, that perhaps where there's skills now, where there's gaps now, may not be the case in, in future need <coughs> to do on an ongoing basis. Um, two questions. The first one is around the, and you've mentioned the, the lack of companies taking steps to upskill their, their employees, and you said that the reason was because some of them were considered as low value, it wasn't economically sensible to do it. Is there also a, a, a um, an explanation perhaps in Northern Ireland that we have so many smaller companies that they just can't afford to, to have their employees out for a period of time or can't afford to do it. And if that is the case, if there's evidence to suggest that, how do you help support those companies or encourage them to top-skill their, their staff? Because I think we all appreciate the importance of it. 
And there is uh, evidence within the, uh, the survey that indicates that it, smaller employers are less likely to invest, uh, uh, sort of in, in terms of that per head uh, contribution. And uh, there's also evidence that suggests that the private sector is a little bit less likely to invest than the public sector. Uh, and it, there's also evidence that suggests that those with the higher level skills out there in the workforce are likely to be the ones that get invested in most, yeah. in a sense. So there is potentially some market failure out there in terms of increasing the skills of those um, that have least skills uh, that are in employment. Um, I mean, I don't know, Michael, if you want to take the question about the, the SMEs and engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And your observation about small companies not being able to release people, we've seen through this recession that it's also the large companies haven't been able to release people. The, since 2007, 2008, we've lost about 40,000 jobs in the Northern Ireland economy, and many of those have been positions that have been paired back. To now, the companies are at a very, they're very, very efficient and lean, and they haven't been able to release people for training. Um, so we've evidence of that. In terms of small and medium-sized enterprises, we have a skill solution service which goes and works specifically with those in companies, particularly less than 250 employees, often less than 10, and skill solutions will work with the company to develop a training plan, to organise the training for them, and to pay for for that if the company are eligible. And since about 2010, we have trained around 19,000 individuals in various aspects of business, technical skills, management and leadership skills. And just the second question, in terms of the um, number of vacancies, percentage of vacancies even during 2013, when we're still in a very difficult economic um, circumstances, and the reason is because of the skills shortage, I think that sends a pretty strong message. Uh, and you've already identified the fact that, okay, specific skills is the number one shortage, but the range of, of, of soft skills, such as oral communication and planning, organisation, customer handling, team working, it, has there been a lack of focus on soft skills because there's sort of a, I don't know, it's been, it's been looked down your nose at a little bit that, that soft skills aren't as important? And is there going to be an increased focus on soft skills and the importance of soft skills and, and teaching young people, even at a school level, I know that at a college level there, there's, there's courses on, on soft skills, but making sure that all learning institutions are focusing on soft skills, particularly given the importance of hospitality and tourism in our economy now as well, and, and that direct interface and even with call centres and things like that. So has there been a lack of focus on soft skills and will there be an increased focus on in the future? I think it's a common problem that's reported to us by employers in particular. Um, I mean, I, I have one anecdote where an employer uh, who manages mechanical and electrical engineering company had applications for a job that he had uh, in tech speak. So the individuals nowadays don't recognise the need for good communication skills as we would know it in terms yeah. of uh, English. It's hard to see where the problem starts, whether it's at school. Uh, from, uh, from our experience in, in the colleges and universities, there's a, a, a large effort put into employability skills and developing employability skills, which we would consider the combination of those soft skills identified in the, in the Commission survey. So it's, it's things like work placement, where individuals not only are taught how to communicate and work in teams, but they have to get that experience. And the evidence shows that those who have had work experience and a work placement are likely to achieve higher in their academic work, but also be more employable. And is one of the reasons why the higher education strategy puts emphasis on all undergraduates being able, given an opportunity for a work placement during their university life. And it was reassuring to hear the Vice Chancellor say that he wants to encourage that. But also, uh, it, the new career strategy is looking at the current review of careers. This is one of the issues that have come up, particularly from employers, about young people having the need to get proper work experience to develop those employability skills. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, so just, uh, now that we see that the, the, the survey has, has thrown up the the areas of skill shortages and the difficulties in retraining and all. What actually will the department be doing to try and you know, redress this particular issue? Well, we work, Chairman. We'll work with companies if they come with us with a specific skills need. We'll work with those companies 
uh, often with a, of whatever size, they generally tend to be the, the small and medium sized enterprises. We'll work with them to develop a training plan for them and to provide the training and fund it if they're eligible. Okay. Bronwyn? Okay. Thank you for your, your presentation and looking at, at Slate 16, the skills shortage vacancies, and I'm looking at hotels, restaurants, and education. Could it be right that it's not actually to do with skills, <coughs> but it's actually to do with the terms uh, and conditions of their contract, i.e. zero contract hours? And you refer to the education sector. Could, could it be cleaning jobs, for example? No, and that's where they find it difficult to fulfil. I mean, would that, are you getting any of that feedback regarding zero contract hours? I mean, I'm assuming if you're trying to make up full-time hours <clears throat> and you get a part-time job in a hotel, and you get one in uh, cleaning and an education sector, that you will be taxed on your second job. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I don't know, so it's going to actually leave it quite difficult for people to get a wage that they can actually live on. I mean, in terms of the, the zero contract hours and that uh, conditions of employment piece, that's something we have raised with the UK CES to see if we can build this into future surveys mm -hmm. um, and identify, because there. Uh, you know, it would be very interesting, I think, and particularly in terms of the investment in uh, upskilling by employers to what extent uh, different types of employment, con people on different kinds of employment contract benefit from that uh, skills investment. Is it people on per permanent contract tracks? Is it people uh, on less permanent contracts that benefit, and if they benefit less, by how much less? So we've raised that issue, and we're keen to pursue that with the UK CES. And also, as well, the, uh, these roles here are the full-time, part-time. Well, I think you know it would be interesting to get that mm -hmm. breakdown as well, but. It's obviously something that just are exploring. We're, we're seeking to, and there's an opportunity, in fact, there's a meeting in September with the UK CES to uh, further steer and look forward to the next version of this uh, employer skills survey and raise uh, the kind of areas that we would like uh, included in that the next time around. And we've already raised this as being one, so we press that point again. Thank you. Okay, Bruno. Yep. <coughs> David? Thanks, Chair. It's probably along the same lines as the likes of the rise of agency employment and temporary workers. Is there any evidence that employers are potentially less likely to invest in the temporary workforce as such? Yeah, and I think it's, it's sort of drawing that evidence out into the survey. That's certainly something that we would be keen to do. So I don't have the answer uh, to that. Uh, currently, um, but it's something we're exploring with the UK CES to see if we can get to the bottom of that in the next the next time this is conducted. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. And uh, aside from what I have uh, seen, the statistics uh, they, they, they certainly make uh, interesting reading. But that just follows up on the question that Bronwyn asked. You know, when uh, you, you look at uh, slide 16 and it talks about the, the the has rate in hotels and restaurants and education. You know, that in itself could cover a multitude of sins. And it doesn't tell you what types of jobs uh, you, you're talking about. Is it uh, the, 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 the people involved in cleaning, people involved in restaurant work, or uh, or is it the, the higher level uh, jobs? Is there a breakdown? as part of to tell you exactly what, what, what these jobs are? Yeah, I mean, there is, uh, there's also occupational information captured with <coughs> this, and it shows, um, in, in terms of occupation, uh, that it is, you know, some of the, the, the certainly whenever you're looking at skills gaps amongst current uh, employees, uh, it tends to be um, uh, that the higher uh, level jobs, the professional, the managerial jobs, employers are reporting less skills gaps amongst those mm. than the elementary type professions and the skilled trades and, and that kind of thing. I mean, one point worth pointing out in all of this as well is that about four-fifths of skills gaps that employers identify are, can be seen as sort of transitory type skills gaps so that they're, they're new people to the job. They're, um, they're on a process of learning the job and being trained for the job. And I think that's interesting, particularly in terms of that piece around uh, the softer skills um, that employers, as they're uh, engaging with a new recruit, um, I think there's a responsibility 
uh, on the employer as well to understand, well, look, this is a, this is a new person to the job and there's a responsibility on the, on the employer to work with that new employee to ensure that those skill needs are met. And I think that's recognised, actually, and reflected within the survey. So that, that's hopefully helpful. Uh, and then is there a possibility that, uh, if it's in it, I haven't seen it, but is there a possibility we could get a breakdown of that, uh, if, if, it, if the survey has picked that up? Uh, and I was one, one of the interesting things there is the whole question of construction. You know, mm -hmm. I know quite a lot of people in the construction industry are out of work. And, uh, they find it very, very difficult getting uh, jobs, mm -hmm. bricklayers, plasters, uh, electricians, <coughs> and, 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 and the, the like many uh, labourers uh, that, that, that would be and, and can't, uh, can't get a job. So I'm actually quite surprised that that's there. It was one of the other things that I think that uh, I, I had raised here before and was concerned about. That with the economic downturn, uh, one of the difficulties you had is that many of the, the training facilities that would have tra usually trained people up to go into employment had moved away uh, from the construction because of the downturn in construction and turned its uh, finger towards uh, car mechanics and things like that. There, so they, they, I was always concerned that there would be. Uh, that, that there, there would be a fall down and the, the level of training that would be provided there. And actually, I'm wondering, is that what's reflected in the figures? We need to be careful what we read in and uh, to these figures, and we need to, I think, do more exploration on some of these points. But, I mean, there's also the point about construction workers uh, migrating from these shores and, and, and going elsewhere. And um, the, the question is, I suppose, uh, and given the figures that we see in front of us here about that employers are reporting that there are skill shortages in those areas, to what extent have people left the industry as a consequence of the downturn? And even now, we know uh, uh, we had uh, we were engaged with construction skills, CITB, uh, only last week, listening to their take uh, on. Uh, the future for the construction industry, and I think they 're pointing out that uh, we 're not likely to be on the kind of uh, upward curve that is being experienced in other parts of the u k but yet we 're starting to steady the ground and and slowly moving into recovery within construction and yet even with that uh, e even with that lighter recovery, if people have moved out of the sector because they feel that it 's a boom bust sector then skills gaps can start to emerge quite quickly as a consequence of that. So that's something we will need to keep our, our eye on, I think. And the, and the other things, I know that um, the new terminology comes in, the likes of soft skills, and it's, what, what's the definition of soft skills? Suppose we would define them as those things like teamwork, problem solving, communication skills, being able to uh, write and be numerate. Um, and I suppose get on with others in the workplace. Uh, Sam, I? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could, could I take it back to 7.2 here, um, where it talks about uh, training workforce development? I guess that's in the three, three summary you did. Somebody did it somewhere. Anyway, um, and it, it, it talks about. Uh, us having the lowest proportion in the United Kingdom in relation to um, workforce development and training. I think it's actually down 2011 from from 2011. And uh, during your research, um, did you look at other areas of, of Europe or other areas, say, like the Republic of Ireland, and comparable figures? And is there anything to learn from any other countries? Including parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. No, I think there. I think there is, and I mean, one of the other uh, complementary bits of work that we've done, and I, I, I spoke to you about before, is the International Survey of Adult Skills, uh, which looks at uh, m more from the individual's perspective than, than the employer's perspective, and I think that's a helpful perspective to get actually to uh, complement and contrast with with what we're hearing through this survey. And I mean, there were some positive messages in that uh, international survey of adult skills. We have improved internationally. We've uh, uh, closed the gap with the OECD average uh, in terms of, of of the skills of our people, and yet we have a huge way to go in terms of closing the gap with some of the top uh, performers. And, um, uh, and, and there's issues, I think, within this uh, survey and within the international survey of adult skills, which shows not just where skills gaps and skill shortages exist, 
but also where skills have been developed but aren't being fully utilised in the labour market. Uh, and in Northern Ireland, that's an issue as well. And certainly, uh, it's as much of an issue here as it is in other parts of the UK, maybe more so than some parts of Europe. So there's, a, you know, there's a drive I think required. And I know this is reflected in the uh, in the skills strategy about encouraging uh, high performance working practices, uh, better skills utilisation once those skills are developed. And it's only, I think by making full use of the skill set that we have and that we're developing, that we can hope to realise the vision of our economic strategy and, and, and the social agenda, in fact, yeah. as well. And just following on from it, Victor, um, obviously you would have some sort of relationship with Invest Northern Ireland, and that report out yesterday was suggesting that things are changing in terms of inward investment. Rather than just giving cash, there may be other aspects, including workforce and training. Um, um, have you any had recent discussions with Invest? Yes, as of even this morning. As well. uh, okay. I have a team that works for me called Assured Skills, yeah. and that works specifically with Invest NI, and have been involved in assuring inward investors that we will have the skills that they need there for them when they arrive. We're involved in uh, things like pre-employment training and help them with the re selection and recruitment. And then they move, once they're here, they move into, seamlessly move into the invest suite of programmes for them, right. uh, the Skills Accelerator, uh, Skills Accelerator Fund. So we work very, very closely with them. My team uh, is working with them on a daily basis. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Chair. OK. Fra, during his question, I did ask for a breakdown in the different sectors. Uh, do you have them, and can you provide them to the committee? We we look into that actually because we um, this I mean there's a wealth of data published by the UKCS for Northern Ireland in June. We've just this week actually received the underpinning data set for all of that. So we're keen to look into that to see what we can derive out of it in terms of occupation uh, against sectoral. Uh, uh, com you know, composition to see uh, can you break down each of the sectors into the kind of occupations within those and where are those skill shortages. Uh, that will be possible potentially in some areas, but because of sample size issues, it may not be possible in all. So we're, we'll explore what, what we can do with that, but, uh, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, see, see, just on that, just a, a, one a small question to add that. <coughs> when, when the survey has been done, does it uh, ask uh, each of the, the employers uh, what the annual real pay is? Are, are, are people paid at the minimum wage? Or are people, uh, is, is that a, a, a question that's asked? It, it doesn't uh, capture information on pay. It captures information on occupation, which I suppose you know, if you're a, a professional in a professional occupation, you can deduce some stuff about pay. But it does ask. Uh, for other reasons why employers find these uh, vacancies difficult to fill, and some of them, uh, you know, employer, there is a, an opportunity for employers to say, well, it's maybe in a low-paid occupation or job. Um, now, we question, I suppose, because it's coming from employers, will employers say, yes, we're paying too, too little for the job? You know, uh, so I think we need to be, need to be uh, considered whenever we're, we're analysing uh, those responses. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, no one else has indicated they wish to ask a question, so Michael and Victor, thank you for coming along today and sharing the presentation with us and taking the questions. Thank you. Members, our next uh, presentation is uh, a departmental briefing on the review of the initial teacher education infrastructure. Table at page 40 is the Ministerial Statement Report on Stage 2 of the Review of Initial Training Education Infrastructure in Northern Ireland. And Table at page 49 is the Report of the International Review Panel on the Structure of Initial Teacher Education for Northern Ireland. And I welcome Mrs. Nuala Kerr, Director of the Higher Education, and Mrs. Carol McCabe, Head of Quality and Initial Teacher Education Branch, to our committee this morning. And we'll give you ten minutes to do your presentation, and then we'll open up for questions. Morning, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad of this opportunity to update the committee on the review. Um, yeah, you will have heard the minister's statement yesterday, and the report that he was talking about uh, has now been published on the, de the department's website. Um, um, what I was planning to do, Chair, was talk through the structure of the report, and then 
between us, Carol and I, and at the end of it, we'll take questions if that's the way you would want to do it. Um, as you know, the review of initial teacher education infrastructure was initially announced in November 2011. Um, the first stage focused on financial sustainability and stability, particularly of the two university colleges, and the Minister made a statement about Stage 1 in May 2013. The findings of Stage 1 focused on the cost, for example, um, of the premia that is paid to the colleges in addition to their core funding. And overall, the study identified that the cost of training a teacher in Northern Ireland is almost 40% higher than their comparator institutions. So on the back of the Stage 1 report, the Minister announced Stage 2, and he appointed an international panel in September last year. The review panel's terms of re reference required it to firstly examine the case for reform of teacher education provision in Northern Ireland, secondly to examine whether the funding being provided could be used better by the teacher trained institutions if they were prepared to move to a more shared or integrated system, and thirdly that he asked them to set out options for the future shape of initial teacher infrastructure in Northern Ireland. The panel itself drew on the evidence that, um, from the international literature practices. Um, the stage one review of the, of the Grant Thornton report, um, written and oral evidence, there was a wide range of current writing on teacher education, including the interim and the final reports of the recent British Education Research Association, Royal Society for Arts and Manufacturing and Commerce, a long title chair, but and the, the BERA uh, RSA inquiry into research and teacher education. Um, and of course, um, the submissions that were received from the various institutions, stakeholders, stakeholders and others who submitted their um, uh, uh, evidence to the, to the panel itself. As a result of all of that, um, Looking firstly at the international trends in teacher education, the panel identified five key trends in teacher education internationally, and these focused on firstly attracting the best candidates into teaching, secondly offering competitive and practice-focused academic awards built on research, uh, thirdly developing strong links between theory and practice, fourthly establishing strong links with continuous professional development, and fifthly, understanding how student teachers learn. Um, and obviously, in this situation, there are parts of this that in, in the Northern Ireland situation we do very well, and that's particularly in attracting the best candidates. But there are a number of areas in which we perform less well, and that's, for example, in the link with research based and a research rich environment. In addition to the international trends, the, the panel also commented on faith-based education across Europe and beyond. Um, and you can see that the, the panel <coughs> valued the contribution that faith-based training offered to our community. Um, we will maybe pick that up later on in questions. But in terms of the strengths of the current provision, the panel identified that teacher education in Northern Ireland had a number of key strengths. Um, and there were um, there was one of them in particular was the widespread commitment to further enhancement of the teacher education uh, provision that's offered currently. But others incur included the positive evaluations by ETI, the alignment with the Queen's stu uh, uh, standards, um, and the. Um, you know, the recruit, their ability, as I said, to recruit strong candidates and, and the high levels of satisfaction that they had with the, with the uh, um, training that they received. However, there were some shortcomings in the current provision, and they identified a series of weaknesses. And these are discussed in, in more detail in the report. But firstly, it was the size and the relatively fragmented nature of the current provision. I mean, they commented that the, 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 the scale of teacher training here in its totality across five institutions would have been the size that would have been in a single institution in the rest of the UK. Uh, secondly, there were um, issues relating to the quality of provision judged against 
international uh, trends. And, for example, the kind of issues they raised was the fact that there are two separate government departments. There's a disjunction between initial teacher education and continuing um, uh, professional development. And, this, and uh, the link with the research performance was extremely uneven. Finally, there, there were areas relating to anomalies and inequalities um, of existing arrangements. And one, for, one was, for example, the access to the certificate in religious education uh, for admission to teacher education programmes. But there's also the admission for uh, teacher education either through UCAS or direct application to an institution, so that there was, there were two ways of um, gaining access to the provision itself. And this gave rise to then uh, um, uh, a consideration by the panel of um, the, um, what would give rise to the international best practice in student education. And I'll pass that over to Carol uh, now. Yeah. Um, going on from the um, information that Nuno has just provided, the panel then focused on um, having built, having discussed the international principles. It also talked about a further principle that needed to be taken into account in Northern Ireland, and that was to do with pluralism. And the panel acknowledges that there are competing interpretations of teacher education and its nature and purpose, um, and comments in some detail on that further in the report. The panel also states, um, however, that the principle of pluralism cannot be accepted on its own, and programmes of teacher education should make provision for students of different faith traditions through shared use of premises, mixed classes, shared teaching and other forms of social engagement. The panel also then states that a, the system which reflects these principles requires four conditions to be met and focuses on, um, for example, an agency or body providing strategic direction, an agreed pattern of teacher education programmes, the introduction of a more rational and dependable system of workforce planning and the need for effective use of resources to eliminate unnecessary duplication of provision and deploy staff in a way that avoids duplication. Section 8 of the report then identifies the option, identifies four options, and the panel identifies common features that all of the options share. Um, these include, for example, that uh, each teacher education course should include a programme of shared ed education, that each uh, teacher education centre should become a, centre, a major centre for continuous professional development, that, current, uh, that both the concurrent and consecutive programmes should be maintained, um, perhaps extending the PGCE to two years and to the award of uh, master's level, and investing further in, sub in continuous professional development. There's a list of the um, f common features that the panel has identified. The panel has also summarised these features in terms of four key priorities, four key criteria, I beg your pardon, and those criteria are quality, efficiency, uh, continued support for the existing diversity of provision, and the potential ease for implementation or practicability. Each of the potential options in the report for reconfiguring the infrastructure is evaluated with reference to these four criteria. <coughs> The options then that the panel has identified, um, and there are four of those as I said. The first option A is to do with co collaborative partnership, and this would involve the four current providers, um, uh, with collaboration being a condition of the funding. The second option, option B, is a two-centre model with the Belfast Institute of Education. The first centre would be based at the University of Ulster with provision in the North West, and the second centre provision in Belfast at Queen's University Institute of Education. The third option is a Northern Ireland Teacher Education Federation. Existing institutions would continue, but with some seeding of responsibilities to a supra-institutional agency. And the final option then is the Northern Ireland Institute of Education, <coughs> where teacher education across Northern Ireland would become the responsibility of a single institution, the Northern Ireland Institute of Education. Uh, Chair, just to conclude on the pa panel's uh, thinking, the panel uh, believed that each of the options, albeit to a different degree, would contribute to the further development of teacher education infrastructure in Northern Ireland by, firstly, um, uh, they advise that the options are not discrete entities. Some of the elements could be pursued in part, as well as in the form set out in the report. And although the panel's specific concern was the initial teacher education infrastructure, it also argued that this couldn't be effectively considered without reference to other key aspects of provision. The report will provide the starting point <coughs> for a constructive 
engagement between providers, stakeholders and politicians in Northern Ireland. The panel recognises that there will be many points of detail that will need to be uh, addressed, and this will be picked up in the autumn um, with the various stakeholders. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we had this on the floor of the Assembly with the Minister, uh, and he was questioned on it. But the panel has identified the four options, and one of the things that is highlighted is the inequalities which uh, currently exist within the, the present system that we have, and that all undergraduate recruits should apply through the UCAS system. The report is here in front of us. Where does this report go from here, and when will it be finalised? Well, are there, our intention is, or the minister's intention is, um, that we will um, allow all of the key stakeholders, the key deliverers, and all interested parties to consider this quite complex report, and uh, and we believe worthy of careful thought. And we, the 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 summer. Uh, a break it gives us an opportunity to consider these, these, this in much more detail. Our intention is is to return to the discussions in September and to pick up uh, uh, discussions with the various stakeholders on the various options um, um, in the autumn and the run up to the uh, the new year. So we would expect uh, to um, have had made good progress in those discussions towards a way forward, um, which is agreeable to all parties. Um, but uh, uh, towards the beginning of the new year. Okay, thank you. It may, sorry, Chair. I, I should have said it may be that, depending on the way the discussions go, it may need, require a, a public consultation on the options, and that would extend the time. But uh, we don't know exactly what way those discussions will go um, from September onwards. Okay. Pat? <coughs> Good morning, Donna. Good morning. Hello. Yeah. Certainly, this has been a, quite a long journey, this, this development. And as I said in the House, it hasn't been an easy passage, either this committee or in the House. I want to follow on from the, from the Chair's comments. I think, uh, somewhat, I think that the committee would favour a route going down that we would have an accelerated process to try and engage with all the stakeholders, to try and look at an option that would be favourably to them, that we can get consensus on. Would you? Given that they're due to come in to see us in September, uh, would there be any thought of bringing in facilitators to try and get to some arrangement or consensus with the stakeholders? Uh, we haven't um, finally mapped out what way we're going to engage with the stakeholders, but we will <coughs> bear that, that in mind. Uh, uh, Chair, um, I think that sounds like an, an interesting uh, proposition. Yeah, because one can imagine, <coughs> I'm not talking on behalf of any groups, there is suspicion there yeah. from, from, of yourselves, quite honestly, from some of the stakeholders. And uh, there is concern about losing, and you talked right about you know, the, the institutions, there is concern about losing the Christian values ethos that they have. And, and maybe at times they, <coughs> they believe that the partner wasn't accepting or respecting that same ethos and going forward. But it was interesting, Chair, that both Noel and Carol both raised that CPDs in terms of... It was interesting you raised it because previously I had raised with you directly why there was no formal collaboration with the Department of Education in terms of the delivery of this programme. Uh, is there any further thoughts on why there was no formal, given the importance of collaboration? between departments? Um, I, I don't know about the specifics of this. Um, so can, can I go back to your earlier comments about the, the suspicion attaching to what we're doing? I, I hope the report has dispelled some of, of those. Um, I know there were very um, considerable reservations about the intentions of the minister um, to to close the institutions or whatever, and I hope the report has shown that was not the intention, that the, the, the report highlights the respect that needs to be attached to the faith-based instit um, institutions, and, and, that, and I hope that the, the manner in which the arguments are, uh, are, are presented in the report, that that gives some comfort to those who would have 
concerns about uh, their ethos and their mission being uh, <coughs> included by this report. So um, I, I hope on that question that you, you would be, you and the others would be more content. The second thing in terms of the CPD, um, you're right, you're right there, I mean there is this, um, w the way the legislation has presented us with this is that we've got responsibility for the infrastructure for the buildings and, and so on, the funding, the teaching and learning funding, but not the content of what's in any of these, um, um, I, uh, the, not the content of what's delivered in the institutions, nor the content of CPD. So in terms of the areas of responsibility, those are within the Department of Education's area responsibility. So the actual content of what the, the initial teacher education involves is, is within their area responsibility. <coughs> so, but I do see that there is a need for us to um, to take their perspective into account in this. You see, that's what I just can't get my head around. You're, you're now suggesting after this long period that you need to take their perspective on it. <coughs> when the careers development, careers professional development, is solely the responsibility of education. It is. Solely yes. responsible. Both of you coming here to do reference in those two areas as key areas, <coughs> but yet and all, you haven't got a perspective from education. I find that astounding, uh, I have to say. Uh, given the remit that the Department of Education has for the continuous development of teachers across Northern Ireland. So I would suggest to you again, you know, there's another piece of work that needs to be done to tie it all on. But uh, one question that I asked in the House Chair, I asked again, the Minister didn't respond to me, and that is in the area of respecting and accepting faith-based organisations or ethos. I would sincerely hope there would be no financial penalties if they're not seen to be collaborating the way the department and some of the options are, are insisting? Our, our intention is to, um, to look forward in, in a positive <coughs> manner, um, to um, encourage the institutions um, in the, way, the direction of, when, of the final option when it is, um, has been identified, and that will be the subject of discussions in the autumn. So it's, it's a bit premature to say which of the options will be, will be um, um, following. And we would hope to, that there will be buy-in, not that, that we're saying at the outset there are those who won't participate in the ultimate outcome. So that, on that question, I'm hoping that there will be consensus and a way forward and issue that the, it will be about how we apply the funds in a positive manner to achieve the best for the children of Northern Ireland. Can I go back then to, um, to your, um, your earlier remark about CPD? And, um, the, um, the, the, the content of both initial teacher education courses and CPD are the responsibility for DE, and that has been clearly our, their position and ours up until now. What the report highlights is that, that, that there needs to be greater, that there are some things that need to be done if we are to achieve um, international best practice in teacher education here. And so we'll have to consider how we will take that forward and um, where are the interests of our colleagues in DE lies relative to the interests that we have responsibility for. Yeah, no, I'm, fine. I'm just surprised that given the importance of it, there, there hasn't been any formal discussions. Okay, Fra. Sure, and uh, thank, thank you for the, 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 the presentation. And I think that uh, the, the, the launcher report has been obviously eagerly awaited. Uh, and I think it's Pat tossed on there many, uh, I believe. Uh, that uh, given Grant Thornton and given this report, uh, that the, 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 the Minister has a fairly fixed agenda on uh, where he wants to go, and that's his, the closure of St Mary's and Stranbullis. And, 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 uh, uh, as part of the report, was there, uh, in, in terms of what they were asked to do, was there a do nothing uh, option uh, put in uh, that would maintain and work with the, 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 the colleges in their present form? Well, first of all, can I say I don't believe it's the minister's repeated no, that you it's can't not speak, his. You can't speak for the minister. You know. I, I do speak for the minister no, you, when you I can't speak for him. I, have I, speak, I speak for the minister in terms of departmental policy when I'm here. So, in terms of it was never the minister's intention to to seek closure of St Mary's. I made, he made that clear at the beginning of the um, of of the uh, of the of all of this work, and repeatedly throughout. 
um, he, um, what his, he wishes is uh, the best possible conditions that will allow teacher education to flourish in, in line with international best practice. That's what, he's, what we're seeking here. Um, in terms of um, uh, the... I'm sorry, I've forgotten your second point. Oh, the do nothing option. In terms of your second point, the, um, uh, the nearest to a do nothing option is, if, is option A, which is essentially that there will, the institutions will continue as they are, that they will that, but they will cooperate more um, in different areas, and that that cooperation will be um, supported by funding and a uh, condition of funding. So that takes into account very much that the two institutions will continue with the same level of autonomy, but that there's greater levels of cooperation in different different uh, areas. Do you want to say something about that? No, I'm just, the, the report does actually mention specifically about a do-nothing option and actually talks about in, in terms of the need for change um, and, and the options that are described. The panel has commented in the report that it doesn't believe the status quo is an option. It has suggested the other four. So do-nothing in its view is not an option. It would be suggesting the other four. Well, well tell me, is, is, is there, has the Minister a plan for subsidy withdrawal uh, from each of the colleges? The, the, the Minister is has these uh, four options to consider, and that's what we will be doing in the autumn. It will be what comes out of the, that process of discussion, um, whatever um, action is necessary. But it, the intention is to create this new environment with uh, with consensus across all of the relevant institutions and to achieve that through, through discussion on the basis of these options. Well, the, the, the same thing, it, does, it, it couldn't pick up uh, that, that means just subsidies would be withdrawn, and that you saying that would be part of the process? No, what I'm saying is that the Minister's entering into a new process. I can't foresee what the outcome of that will be. What we have is a range of options, and the Minister can, in discussions with the, um, with the sector and others, will um, reach a, a conclusion, we hope, on a single option that has consensus um, across the board. Um, and so the question of penalties or anything else doesn't come into that. So uh, what, what, what happens if, uh, at the end of this process, that one or, or other of the colleges uh, don't buy into the report? What happens there? We, uh, that's a position that we we'll have to consider in the process uh, during the course of that process. Yes. Okay, Robin. Thanks, Chair. Um, sorry, lady, for missing your presentation. I don't see anywhere in the paper. Anyhow, where the department is going to tackle the mismatch between the Department of Education actually setting the number of teachers that are to go through whatever option is proposed or followed. Is that discussion anywhere? Yeah, it is raised in the report, and it said it rec the panel recommended that we needed a more dependable um, um, process for identifying the number of teachers that needed to be um, to be trained um, in response to the needs of the you know to the needs of the schools. So it, it is addressed in the report. And I think also the report does comment on the better links between the two departments in terms of teacher education generally. Um, so it, it would be in that context as well that that issue would be picked up. But you don't have to buy in from the Department of Education that that will be something they will do as something thrown out of this report? <coughs> Um, um, in, in respect of that particular item, the uh, Department of Education indicated to us that we were awaiting the to see what this report would say um, uh, in terms of what action that, that they needed to do in terms of their predictive model. Can I ask then, depending on the option that is followed through, if the Minister of Education was opposed <coughs> to one of those recommendations and then decided, no, I'm just going to keep on sending you... I don't know how many teachers every year. I, you know, I, I'm not worried. Can he do that then? He can. He led it in, in legislation. That's his power to do it. Okay. Um, touching on some of the, I think it was parts. You know, and they mentioned a specific institution. The final part of the, I suppose, the statement refers to the minister engaging with stakeholders to bring forward these options. If one of the institutions <coughs> flatly refuses to accept any of the four and reverts back to the do nothing and we just want to remain our autonomy. How will the department manage that or handle that? I think at this stage 
I, no decisions have been made if, uh, if there is to be no participation. At this point, what, we're, what we are trying to do is to seek consensus across uh, in relation to um, the way forward, based on some of the options that the um, some or other of the options that the panel has put forward. I mean, at this stage, we would still be hopeful that we would get engagement. It's been indicated um, to the panel that there is a recognition that there is um, scope for enhancement in what is offered, and all of the institutions indicated their willingness to be part of that. Okay, thank you. Can you tell me? Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask you, um, are you aware of any responses to date, public responses from both Stranmillis and Samirich in relation to, to the, the Minister's statement? Uh, the just what we have seen in the press. Right. So, um, um, I think there, uh, there's just a, um, a. I think I, I don't think we're in a position to say what what the detail because it's a very complex report, um, and it would be unjust to just to take a knee jerk reaction from any of the institutions as stating their position. I think what I mean are the ministers' wish, wish was that the institutions would um, give careful consideration to what the panel had said because they are. I mean they're very rigorous and intellectually challenging some of the, the, the ways that they're suggesting. What we t um, the, the panel were very keen that the institutions understood uh, what the options meant and they met them uh, on um, Monday afternoon uh, to talk them through what, what was in the report and there may well be opportunities to explore that again later in the year. So, I haven't heard. I mean, I couldn't say we've got any specific reaction um, that we could, that you would want to hold anybody to at this stage. Well, well certainly, what I would have picked up over this past number of months is that there certain, <coughs> seem to be certainly within in some areas, and, and, and we've had them in here. Um, not so sure the extent of Stramalis, but they're. But I imagine they would also be open to change yes. and open to shared education, yes. um, as an example. And I'd ask the minister in the assembly already to give us an assurance um, if they were willing, willing um, to work um, with the department, would the department support them to become sustainable? Because that's one of the biggest issues in yeah. terms of economic viability. Um, um, do, do you feel that there is that, that will within the department? to try and support both Stramwell and Sands and Mary's uh, become sustainable? Well, it's certainly the intention to, fi to find a way of, of, of um, balancing these competing demands. Um, and we, we all know the financial pressures that everyone's going to be yeah. uh, is under and will be in the future. And uh, um, so, I mean, the, the minister will have to balance all of those competing considerations out. But in terms of their willingness to cooperate, uh, how do you want to comment further on that? I, I would say the panel's um, impression and view would be strong that those that they met with in the early part of the year and that informed this report were very definitely uh, keen to engage in the autumn. And I think the context for that engagement is very definitely the report and the, the detail of the report will be what we would um, talk over with the institutions, with the stakeholders in the, in the autumn time. And I think the panel's view would be that there was a willingness from all parties to, to engage with them on the report. Okay, thanks, Carl. Thanks, Nella. Thank you, Chair. All right. No one else has indicated to ask a question. So, Yula, Carl, we thank you very much for thank you. coming along to the committee today. Thank you. Members, any other business? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, one issue, Yeah, there's, there's actually two issues I want to raise, okay. and it's regarding table correspondence, okay, which we received at nine o'clock this morning. I am reading correspondence here from the Department regarding the impact of the Savoury Delivery Plan 7 on the Section 75 groups and frontline services. And I think there's, a, there's some further questions you know, to be asked around that. Page 14. Oh. Page 14. <clears throat> yeah. Regarding the, the key risks that, that was identified, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago, which stated that I am. Um, the, the colleges are dependent on the block grant for the, the major part of their income. Two colleges in particular may not be in a position to sustain further cuts in their funding, but all six colleges could find it very difficult to deliver existing levels of services. 
and it's stated here that it will have no impact on se Section 75 groups. I think there's questions to be asked around what is meant by shared services. Um, what does that mean for people with disabilities? Um, regarding investment in staff development, for example, are they employing less part-time lecturers? And there's more of a workload now on full-time lecturers. And flexible course delivery, I mean, for example, you know, what impact does that have on people who have dependents? Um, they, it may suit them to, to attend a course during the day where the uh, child might responsibilities, but they may not have that in the evening time. So I think there's further questions to be asked you know, on that. I, I mean, I find it intriguing that there's no impact on Section 75 groups, given the fact that the, the risks have been identified here in, in, in our presentation. So. I would appreciate if we could go back and ask further questions. On yeah, not a problem. We'll, we'll be able and to write back to yeah. the department on that, yeah. And, and secondly, an email which I think probably affects everybody. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. again, we're, we're quite happy to pass this forward yeah. to, the, yeah. to the department. Chair, I think, you know, if, if you look at the last paragraph, again, w with no evidence in that, but I think we should be fighting out, you know, that potentially 750 people could be out of a job, again with no evidence, but I think we need to drill down on that point as well. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Fair enough, we'll pass that forward <coughs> to the department. Sam, just a question, um, the format for next <coughs> Wednesday? Yeah, half 11 in here. Yeah. But, uh, um, so, so what, what actually happened? What's, what's We're going doing happen? apologies and then straight in the briefing on steps to success. Yeah. And then date and time of next meeting. That's it. No correspondence. And Cathy, will, will we have glimpses of that before the meeting as such? I don't even know if we'll have a paper before. Right, just the way they gave us the, the, the teacher um, review. Because I would doubt it because it's only been announced that morning. Um, okay. We might just have a press release or something to okay. come before the committee at half eleven. Yeah. So it's just an announcement what's going to be the house. Yeah, and we're having hands out as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, folks. You know that you know the date and time of next meeting next week at eleven thirty in this room. Be here. <laughs> Sharp. <laughs> meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room twenty nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.